this research is a, is a collaboration with my research team, consists of myself, uh, Professor Yasheng Chen from Simon Fraser University, and also Tota Pangabean from the same university. So this research is tried to uh, investigate the relation between visual attention and how it affects decision quality. And based on the knowledge that we learn from this research, we try to develop a training program and decision aid that uh, incorporate, that use the fit forward learning approach uh, in order to help managers, particularly those that are inexperienced novice managers, so that they don't make mistake, but they can improve their decision quality. Just to give you some ideas about our research settings, it is a laboratory experiment, and we do have a computer lab where we invite managers to come and then they perform their uh, the experimental tasks. So they need to wear these uh, eyeglasses. Oops. They need to wear the eyeglasses and then we capture everything, all their activities, what information they look at, and how long they spend on a certain aspect of that uh, particular information. And we want to understand whether the time they spend, their search strategy also affect their decision. So the, the basic idea of this research is very simple. Uh, it is based on the well-known uh, performance measurement framework. So the notion is that uh, for companies, if they want to measure their managers or their employees, they have to be very, very careful of what variables they want to use. Because if you measure the wrong variables, then you are going to get the wrong result. Right? I'll give you an example. Uh, in my class, I think participation is very important and I want students to be part of this learning process. I think that's the better way to teach my student. So in order to uh, achieve this objective, of course I need to measure participation, right? On the other hand, if I measure attendance, then student will come, sit nicely, smile, say nothing, right? What do I get? I don't get their participation. So the idea is that we have to be very careful in determining what variables we want to use to measure the performance of our managers or our employees. Because what is important need to be measured. And when we measure something, it gets to be accomplished, right? If we measure participation, people will come regularly, say nothing, all right? Now, uh, a good performance measurement and evaluation system, if the managers or employees perform well, then we need to reward them. Not necessarily monetary, maybe a pat in the back is enough, but that's just reinforce the notion that they have done a good job and then they will think, hey, I've done a really good job, I have accomplished my target, then I will do it in the future then the, the circle goes on and on. So that's basically the, the, the notion that we try to promote in this research. Now, unfortunately, talking about performance measurement, uh, many companies still rely on these uh, very common measures. For example, a return on investment, right? Basically this measure tells you how much profit the company has generated based on the total investment they have made or another uh, measure, return on equity. How much profit you have generated based on the shareholders' money that we use in our company, right? It's very common, uh, it's very simple, easy to understand. That's why you know, it's easy to compare. If there are two, three companies, then we can compare their return on investment or return on equity very easily. Then we can determine which company performed better. Right? So that's the strength of these measures. However, there are some drawbacks. The first one is this measure primarily use financial aspect. 
And we know financial is not the only thing for companies to survive. There are many other non-financial aspects that we need to pay attention to. For example, customer satisfaction, right? It's non-financial, but it's important. If we don't satisfy our customers, then we don't have future business, okay? Um, another thing, employee turnover, for example. Maybe we have a high turnover, and it's very costly. Although turnover is not measured in terms of money, but it is also eventually will affect the company's financial performance. Another aspect of this business is focus too much on historical, historical activities. Why we get high profit now? Because we did well in the, in the past, right? But this, future, uh, this current success does not guarantee future survival. Another uh, disadvantage is the lack of predictive power. We cannot predict the future as compared to, for example, if you train your employee well, then you can predict that in the future, your company will be better off, right? Because your, com uh, your employees' skills are updated, they can cope well with this ever-changing business environment. The last one is uh, reward wrong behavior. Think about return on investment. If you don't train your employees, actually you improve your bottom line, right? Because you don't incur these expenses. Then you reward wrong behavior. You said, hey, you did a good job by not training your employees. Indirectly, of course you don't say that. But uh, is it because you improve the bottom line? So to overcome this uh, problem, the, the weaknesses of uh, traditional performance measures, uh, many companies nowadays have in, uh, incorporated this balance scorecard. The basic idea is the balance scorecard incorporate both lead and lag variables. Lead variables are variables that you do now that will benefit the companies in the future. For example, research and development. If you do it now, maybe it, you will suffer in the short term in terms of the bottom line, right? But in the future, you will better survive. The, the basic notion of this balance scorecard is that companies have to incorporate not just financial, but also non-financial aspect of their business. When you look at here, the, fir the first one is the first one is uh, financial aspect. It's still financial, it's still important, but it's not the only one. That's the, the main uh, message here. Financial is basically tells you whether you have satisfied the requirement of your shareholders. Okay. You also have to consider customer perspective. How well you satisfy the expectation, the needs of your customers how well you perform your day-to-day -day activities, how, how you excel, improve the efficiency, for example, in terms of internal business processes. And the, the fourth one here is how you can sustain your ability to innovate, to be able to meet the, the changing demand of the business and also the uh, customers. So just to give you a brief idea, this is a, like a one semester lecture, but I just give you a basic idea. Uh, the balance scorecard eventually will ask companies to determine what are the key performance indicators. So when you look at the, the process of developing this system, then companies will start with their mission and vision. They look at the strategy and then uh, determine what are the specific measures they want to use in order to realize, to achieve this vision and mission. Now, I, work, I used to work as a business consultant, and every time I show this strategy map, uh, in general, they are excited because they can see now the relationship between all these variables that they are going to measure and eventually how all these variables will maximize the, uh, sorry, the, stake, the stakeholders' value. Just look at an example of this green arrow here. Let's say the learning and growth 
component or perspective. This one is uh, how much you spend on activities in training your employees, in motivating your employees to share their knowledge, right? Down here, you maybe companies or even lower level managers, they don't see how these activities will eventually benefit the company as a whole because they're quite far from the uh, level here. So if you train your employees, then maybe next month you, will go, you are going to improve the, the efficiency of your operation, right? If you improve your efficiency, then you will be able to lower your price, you will be able to increase the quality of your product, and then you'll see it will increase the, the growth of your revenue, and of course, eventually, we expect that, hey, the return on investment will increase, right? But it's not the only one. That's uh, the, the main message here. Financial is not the only one. Companies also need to have a more balanced approach in measuring uh, performance. Now, when you look at the balance scorecard, it is quite comprehensive, quite complicated, right? So when you look at this diagram here, this is a traditional one, then they introduce balance scorecard, but balance scorecard is not without a problem. And that's the focus of our research. Actually, balance scorecard, companies that use balance scorecard, they suffer what is coined as common measure bias. So when um, managers are overwhelmed with all these measures, in, on average, companies that use balance scorecard, usually they have about 16 to 20 different measures. So it's very complicated, right? And we, you, when you are overwhelmed with, with all this detail and all these measures, what do you do? Usually you go back to your comfort zone, which is unfortunately the common measure, like the financial measures, because they are more familiar with these measures. So um, why the, the common measure bias happen because of the lack of attention to the unique measures or to the lead variables, to the variables that are unique to the companies or to the business unit. We know that business unit that uh, use a different strategy, they have a different key success factors, right? I'll show you later. So the main theme of our research is attention. Now I give you the, an example. There are two distinct uh, business unit strategy. When you look at here, the first one is cost leadership. Think about Huawei, or I was thinking about maybe fair price. Where their, you know, their, uh, their. I think their slogan is low price and more, right? So it's very clear that they use lower cost leadership strategy. What is their, their main uh, competitive weapon? So here, of course, uh, they need to save cost. Uh, they need to be very efficient, a low price, and usually this type of company achieve a very high standardization. They produce standardized product, uh, commodity products. Uh, think about Huawei, I don't know whether this is correct or not. But both strategy, remember, both strategy can be very successful. Okay, well, look at uh, fair price, it's very successful, right? I was about to compare between fair price and cold storage. I tried to uh, justify whether this is right or not, but I decided to use this. I think this is more obvious. Uh, so I, I believe this company use cost leadership strategy. So these are possibly their, main, their unique measures. Well, a differentiation, think about Apple. Apple, uh, you know, they always come up with new products uh, and probably their, their unique measure should be how much revenue they generate from their new products that has been introduced in the last three years, for example, or, uh, or even in the last years. Now Apple introduced their product very fastly, very quickly, right? Number of patents that they, they are granted by the government, uh, R&D, research and development expenditures, or uh, how much design, how many design changes based on the, their previous product. So you see, it's a very different uh, competitive weapon, very different key success factors, right? 
And as I mentioned, sometimes these unique measures, managers are not familiar with. That's why they go back to their comfort zone, which is the common measures. And you see, both strategies can use the same measures, what we call common measures, right? Return on investment, earning per share, market share, or employee turnover, all are common to any business units. And usually these common measures are not as important as the unique measures. So what is attention? Remember our, our main focus is attention, right? So what is attention? According to Kahneman, he won the uh, Nobel Prize some time ago, I think in 19, I don't remember exactly. But uh, actually what he said is, uh, we have a limited capacity. Our, our uh, brain has a limited capacity. So attention is the process of uh, allocating our limited capacity into a certain stimuli. And in order to process that information effectively, we basically have to ignore some other information. Now I just uh, found this uh, picture here. It's kind of interesting. Let's say you want to learn uh, guitar, right? I know Nick uh, learned guitar. So he wants to learn guitar, and he searched for internet, for the internet, how to learn guitar. Then he will find a lot of different things, maybe about barbecue, go to picnic. In order to focus his attention on learning guitar, he has to ignore some of this information, right? Especially these days with all this social media, it's very difficult to focus. There are a lot of distractions. Now, in order to process for students, in order to process information, learn more effectively, try to ignore. Maybe sometimes it's a good idea to turn off your cell phone, right? Not you are wired 24 hours, <laughs> seven days a week. Anyway, there have been some previous research in this area. And basically what they did is they look at the, they give some input. For example, they vary the presentation formats. Um, maybe information about uh, learning guitar, right? In terms of uh, pictures, a graph, and, or just basic information. And then, then they observe the output. And then they infer from the output that this input affect the output. But um, we are not satisfied with that because uh, previous research basically treat the process, the cognitive process as a black box. They just assume that uh, people will attend, for example, all the information available and then make decisions based on those assumptions. While our research try to understand the process, how managers actually process information when they are provided with multiple uh, performance measures in this case. So we use this uh, theory, which is the theory of attention, Basically, this theory tells us that attention has two components. The first one is uh, how informative the, the information is or the stimuli is, and then how the stimuli is being presented or the salience. What is the perceptual features? Can be in terms of color, uh, text, graph, size, or uh, where you place this information. All right, so uh, these two then will determine how much attention you will put to a certain stimuli. And according to this line of research, you can measure the attention based on your eye movement and how long you spend on a certain, uh, what we call the area of interest. And then this attention will eventually affect your decision. Now our basic uh, research design is that um, First thing, we want to measure whether if you do understand your goal, because informativeness, when you look at here, informativeness is very much influenced by the goal. Let's say you, the goal is to come here, right? Then you use your GPS to search for information. Maybe it will give you information about a gas station, about restaurant. Uh, they are not related to your goal. They are still in, um, you know, stimuli, but they are not related to your goal, okay? So it's, you're not going to pay attention to that, that type of stimuli. But if it is 
about the the what what road you need to to do, what is the traffic light, what is the shortest distance to come here, right? Then it is related to your goal to come here, and that's informative. Okay. On the other hand, then um, what is the format of this information? Maybe it's a bright color, and those also will affect the attention. So basically, the, the first idea is that, or in uh, research term, the first hypothesis is that I try to stay away from this research term terminology as much as possible. So the first one is, uh, sorry, we are interested in how the goal affect the attention, and the second one, how the presentation format also affect the attention, and then eventually, um, attention to the unique measures in this case, and then eventually the uh, decision quality. The second stage is we are also interested in the search pattern. The advantage of using this eye tracking is you can track the, the pattern of their search strategy. And we observe a very different pattern between experienced manager and inexperienced managers. So we learn from this research that, um, I'll tell you later, but uh, it's a very different uh, search strategy that they use. So um, based on this knowledge, now we are, we are uh, trying to, to develop a training program so that uh, we can teach these novice managers so they don't need to make mistakes or learn from feedback, but learn from this fit forward uh, research strategy. So we have uh, 60 managers, and uh, interestingly, uh, 38 are female, and only 22 male. So in Vancouver area, I don't know whether this is a good representation of the population, but there are more female managers in Vancouver area than, manage, uh, than uh, male managers. So average working experience uh, 10 years, and uh, we randomly assign into these three different uh, categories. So group one, basically, we just give them the, the participants a, a, a very concise explanation about the, uh, the strategy and the link between strategy and performance measures. The second group is we add more information with examples, for example, with, with more narrative, narration. And then the third one, about the graph. So you can immediately see, basically, this presentation format represents the salience, while these two measures represent the goal. If they do understand the goals, then they are going to put more attention to the common, uh, to the unique measure, sorry. Okay? So what is the, the manipulation? It is a little bit of research. So you'll see we have two version of our, our uh, experimental materials. The first one is we uh, design the measure where all the unique measure of strategic business unit A outperform the unique measure of strategic unit B, and vice versa for the common measure. So if the managers pay more attention to the unique measures, then they should, uh, the decision is how strongly you will promote these managers. So the decision is if, if the, uh, they pay more attention to this unique measures, they should promote business unit A manager, right? If, you, if they suffer the common measure problem, then they will promote the business unit B managers. See it. On the other hand, the, the opposite is true for the second version. So we want to see and compare whether they, they experience these common measures and how, uh, how different they are in terms of experienced and inexperienced managers. So the result is interesting. When you look at here, remember the theory said that actually these two, which is the goal, the informativeness, and the salience, the presentation format, should have a significant influence on attention. On the other hand, we found that actually presentation format doesn't matter, particularly 
for the experience managers. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so we found it's not significantly related to how much attention they put on the unique measures. Uh, but the decision quality is significantly influenced by the amount of attention they pay to these unique measures. Now in terms of information search strategy, we find that the goal awareness, again, dominate, is significant, and more experienced managers use directive, directive strategy. So directive strategy looks like this is the, one of the performance measures. You see, if we present this to the inexperienced managers, the way they search is they look from number one, and then they go to number two, number three, number four, and they go sequentially based on the, the, uh, the way the, the information is presented to them. And we randomly assign these measures, so it's not always like this. And we keep uh, observing this sequential search strategy for inexperienced managers. On the other hand, for the more experienced managers, then they will see this LC is like a link common. LU is link unit, unique. So we'll see managers, uh, experienced managers will go from LU, for example, then they will jump to LU here, they will jump to another LU here, and they'll go to another LU here. So they, they search information that are consistent with the goal that they, they have learned from uh, before, from the uh, stage before, where inexperienced managers go sequentially. And uh, you can intuitively say that this sequential search strategy is not very efficient, right? Because uh, now you have to go over all these less important measures, and then you spend more time on this less impo important aspect of the business. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. And, uh, as you see, this is a typical balance scorecard. It's not an easy measure. It's very complicated. That's why it's very easy that managers go back to the common measure bias. And the way we measure is we, we can, uh, you know, statistically, we can measure the correlation between the way information is presented and the way they search the information. So we compare between the correlation coefficient of information presentation and information search. Then we can determine whether they use sequential or they use uh, directive information search. And the, the result is, uh, when you look at here, if you pay more attention to the unique measures, then it is more likely that you are going to make a better decision. The same thing happened to this uh, search strategy. If you make more directive or the correlation is uh, lower, between the presentation sequence and the search strategy, then you make a better decision. So, what we learned from these studies? Novice managers, they have difficulties in understanding the link between strategy, remember I showed you before, the, all the KPI, the key performance indicators are derived from the company strategy and vision and mission, right? So here, for novice managers, those that have less than two uh, years of working experience, they have difficulties really to, trans to understand what is the link between this company strategy and all these measures. While uh, more experienced, what we call expert managers, they have a high level of understanding of the link. The second one is novice managers tend to be influenced by the what we call per perceptual feature-driven search. So um, if you change the presentation format, then they are going to change the, their level of strategy. So they are being influenced by how you present that information to them, whether it is very detailed or you use some graph, then the, the, their uh, decision is going to be influenced by the presentation format. On the other hand, here, for export managers, they are very knowledge driven. So they know the, the, uh, the link between strategy and the measure, and they go directly to the unique measures. So they use the directive search 
strategy. What is the main takeaway? Our research has shown that uh, in accounting we call it substance over form, right? So for knowledge managers, they do rely more on their knowledge about the, the company strategy, the link between the, the strategy and the measures, and they do search information related to their knowledge. Uh, and those strategy, of course, improve their decision processes. Another takeaway is uh, now we can learn, it's not just the black box, remember I told you the black box, but uh, we can move from the black box to transparency. Now we do understand why different managers make different decisions, because they process information differently. Right? In the past, we always assume if we provide a lot of information, people will attend to that information and we will process all the information. Our, our research told us, informed us that that's not the case, especially for experienced managers. Yes, it is true for the novice managers, but it's not true for the more experienced uh, managers because they selectively process the information provided to them. So that's why for students, it, it's, it's, uh, it's good to learn, right? When you learn, then you can filter information better and you, you can make a better decision. So this is what, what next, uh, what we are trying to do now. We gain this uh, knowledge. We try to develop a training program based on the scan path of these experts. So we classify our sample into expert and novice, and then we compare their uh, search strategy, their scan path, the way they move their uh, eyes, and then uh, sorry. And then we are, we are going to use this to train novice managers, especially for companies that use multiple measures. It's, it's very complicated so that um, we don't have to have a very costly uh, practice. For example, in the past, uh, usually we ask them to do, and then when they make mistake, then we can make a corrective action. But sometimes it's very costly, right? They already make mistakes. Why don't we prevent these mistakes by informing them this is the way experts behave. And you know, if you, you follow this uh, practice, you don't need to make mistakes. Or at least you can minimize the potential mistake that you, you will make in the future. So this is what we call a fit forward uh, approach. So provide training, train based on expert information, uh, make sure that they, they do understand the link between the, the strategy and the performance measure before we let them do their job. Otherwise, then we'll suffer this feedback loop system where they make mistake and it incur so much cost and then they can uh, make the corrective action. So these are some uh, benefits of this fit forward learning. The first one is we can increase judgment accuracy if they can quickly learn how experts behave, how, how experts search and process information, then they can increase their judgment accuracy. They can make better decisions. The second one is uh, expedite decision making processes. Of course, now you don't have to go sequentially in order to understand all this information. You can jump directly to the more important information and spend more time on those aspects. Uh, increase decision quality and, of course, free up your cognitive uh, capacity. Right? So now you can filter better and you can uh, use your, your brain more effectively. So what is for JCU? I'm glad that our... Uh, leader uh, is here. So this is a, just a, a simple example. Let's say our strategic intent is to create creating a brighter future in the tropics uh, worldwide through graduate and discoveries that make a difference. Okay. So I just highlight discovery. Let's say we want to focus on discovery. Of, co of course we can focus on graduates, but this is just an example. Discoveries. And then discoveries in, is translated into a belief that we recognize 
that knowledge has the power to change the lives, right? So then, based on this knowledge, now we have to think about, remember the, the balance scorecard, right? Start from strategy, and then you look at the strategic objective, what is your belief, and how we are going to measure this in a concrete way. So I believe, I just come up with some ideas. Let's say for, for, for us, in terms of knowledge, then the unique measures might be number of publication, how many citations we get from our papers, uh, how innovative our teaching approach, so students can benefit from that. Right? This is the, the related to knowledge. Of course, we can also use some common measures to measure the success of our university, right? In terms of net profit or return on investment or other common measures. Now, I give you an example. Let's say we have two big uh, departments here, business and psychology, right? Business, um, maybe business is easier, I don't know. I don't have the financial figures. But maybe business is easier to achieve this common measures, right? Because we can charge, uh, for example, premium tuition, for example. In Canada, we do that. For business, we charge much, much higher tuition than other departments, right? But probably, we don't generate much of publication, or our paper is not cited well in, in the uh, uh, literature. We teach a very basic knowledge, and uh, we don't have an innovative uh, business teaching approach, right? Because they're so technical and uh, something like that. On the other hand, psychology, they might not be able to generate a lot of profit, right? But they have a lot of publication, um, high number of citation, a very innovative uh, teaching approach because they, they understand the personality of students, this kind of aspect. So they perform really well in these unique measures, but probably perform a bit poorly in the, in the common measures. Now the question is, if I'm the top management here, which manager should I promote? Which one do you think? Is that psychology, uh, the dean of psychology department, or the dean of business? It's a hard question, right? It's not easy. Business is very profitable, and well, many people will say this is a very successful department, although they suffer from these unique measures, which are more consistent with our strategic intent to make a difference, right? to create knowledge, while psychology performs well in that direction. So I leave that up to the leaders. <laughs> There's no, no answer for that. And that's all I have to say this evening. I will be very happy to entertain any questions you have. I hope we have learned something from this research and we are very excited. This is in a very early stage and we hope uh, now we are doing several uh, different projects. I have two PhD students now in Canada. They are doing like a follow-up studies. We are looking at, uh, for example, how um, different compensation system might affect the, the way people learn. There are so many different uh, aspects of this research that uh, we are very uh, excited to do this. And hopefully we can benefit the, the business society, for example, these things. We can uh, develop a training program or uh, decision aids that uh, can be very useful for companies that use these multiple performance measures. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. Công ty Tân Đại Dương là một trong những công ty du học đầu tiên và hàng đầu tại Việt Nam, được thành lập bởi đội ngũ các nhà quản lý và tư vấn du học có nhiều năm kinh nghiệm trong ngành giáo dục cũng như được tu nghiệp và đào tạo ở nước ngoài. Với hơn 10 năm kinh nghiệm, Tân Đại Dương tự hào là nhà tư vấn du học chuyên nghiệp cho các du học sinh tại các nước trên thế giới, đặc biệt là Mỹ, Úc, Singapore, Anh Quốc, Hà Lan, Thụy Sĩ v.v. Cùng với đội ngũ tư vấn viên chuyên nghiệp, chúng tôi cung cấp các dịch vụ uy tín và trọn gói cho ngành du học du lịch Mỹ, bao gồm xử lý trọn bộ hồ sơ đi Mỹ từ A đến Z, kể cả các hồ sơ khó đã từng rớt visa hoặc không đủ tài chính. Tư vấn chọn trường tại tất cả các tiểu bang ở Mỹ, chúng tôi tự hào là đại diện chính thức của hàng trăm trường đại học cao đẳng, trung học phổ thông tại Mỹ. Hướng dẫn các thủ tục xin visa, chứng minh tài chính, hướng dẫn điền form, dạy phỏng vấn du học du lịch Mỹ. 
Khai giảng hàng tháng các lớp học phỏng vấn, đảm bảo cho học sinh có được sự tự tin trả lời được mọi câu hỏi của lãnh sự quán. Đặt vé máy bay, sắp xếp nhà ở, ký túc xá cho du học sinh. Với phương châm hoạt động là uy tín, chất lượng và mong muốn định hướng cho học sinh Việt Nam một nền giáo dục tiên tiến, môi trường học tập và sinh hoạt an toàn, Tân Đại Dương cam kết sẽ là người bạn đồng hành cùng học sinh Việt Nam trên đường tới chân trời tri thức. Mọi chi tiết xin liên hệ công ty Tân Đại Dương chuyên du học Mỹ, mặt tiền 148 sườn 1, Trần Quang Khải, phường Tân Định, quận Nhất, Thành phố Hồ Chí Minh, điện thoại 08 3848 4879 0989 006 890, website www.tandaidương.edu.vn